Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you for taking the time to come here to, to hear my presentation. Um, I'm a retired high school librarian, a former, um, and I'm a student, still a student, and I'm certainly not an expert on the Civil War. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is a little bit about how I, through a series of remarkable circumstances, found materials, documents in an attic of an abandoned house and the research it took to put together the story of two soldiers. And the two soldiers I'm going to talk about, can everybody hear me with Mike or not? I hope so. Are Hiram Seymour Hall and Benjamin Coffin. Now the locale for this is local. It's in the Mount Morris, Nunday, Geneseo area. Everybody familiar with that area down near Electra State Park? Um, Lima is the school, and I don't want to get ahead of that, but um, that's where most of this, the first part of the story took place. And it's kind of, and I hope it's not too boring to you to hear this, but it's kind of my life story also. At the time, I was a young man working for Cy Coffin on a um, farm on the uh, County Line Road right here, Picket Line Road, uh, River Road, between Nunday and Mount Morris. And as a young man, I was helping this man, Cy Coffin, convert a dairy barn into a chicken and egg laying operation. And my job solely was to make, put together metal chicken cages for 30,000 chickens. <laughs> and it was a long, laborious summer, let me tell you. I started as a junior in high school and I worked for him for about a year, year and a half. And he was an entrepreneur. He had a lot of different kinds of businesses besides a dairy farm. He had beef cattle. Um, he raised uh, cattle to sell. Um, even dairy cattle he sold for meat. He had race horses, trotters and pacers. Um, at one time he owned a restaurant. He was a, an entrepreneur who owned a lot of land. And I didn't know all of this. I was just a young man um, working for him. And I lived in uh, Portageville, New York. And he came every day to pick me up and take me home. It's, I started in the summer and then I worked for him after school in the winter. As you can imagine, um, during the hot summer days, being cooped up in a barn making wired chicken cages, I, I needed to have a break. So during lunch periods, I would walk down the road. And about a quarter mile from his farm was an abandoned house. Now, it didn't look this good. This is a family photograph that I got afterwards. But there was this beautiful old house sitting, there was no paint on it, it was just brown clapboards, it was intact, sitting in a field. There was no driveway, no sidewalk, it was behind barbed wire fence, and there were cattle grazing around it. And at that time, I collected coins and stamps. As a young man, I collected coins and stamps. So one day at, after work, I asked Cy Coffin, who owned that house? And he said, I own this whole hilltop. So I said, well, would I be able to uh, go in the house and take a look for coins and stamps and he told me you can go in the house and have whatever you want and I said okay can I borrow a flashlight so I borrowed a flashlight one day after work walked a quarter mile down the road to this house now this is a center entrance federal style a colonial house which means that the center entrance on both floors is a hallway it's a rectangular house two rooms on the left two rooms on the right both up and down first and second floors so when I went to the house, I tried to go in the front door. Of course, it was locked. So I went around to the back. And in the back was a summer kitchen. And Cy Coffin was a practical farmer. He didn't waste or misuse anything. He didn't have to build a grain bin because the summer kitchen was ample. And he used to store, he used to store grain for his dairy cattle and his beef cattle. And imagine when walking in there, the, the smell, the odor from decaying rye and wheat and barley, um, but it was kept dry so he could use it for his cattle. Well, when I went to the back door to get into the house, the back door was literally boarded over. There were six or eight boards, and the back door was boarded over, and I was a strapping young man, so I was able to pull the boards off and try to enter the house while the door was really jammed shut. And I leaned against it several times. Finally, I gave it one gigantic push, 
and I entered the house, and this is a true story. As I entered the house, it was like the house took a breath. It was like vacuum sealed, and it was a twilight zone moment for me because it was so hard uh, to believe because when I went in the house, I came into the kitchen, and everything was there. There was a cook stove with pots and pens and kettles. There was a table with little odds and ends from, from a kitchen. There were shelves. There was a sink with a hand pump for the water. But I was looking for coins and stamps. I wasn't looking for kitchen apparatus. So I went over to the dining room, which is across the hall. And the dining room had a large, round, oval table, cherry table, with china, silverware, crystal glasses. It had bookcases full of books. And the only thing that was different about it was that above the bookcases, the wallpaper had started to come off the wall. So nobody had been in the house for a long time. It was intact, but it had been abandoned and left just the way it was whenever the people lived in the house. And um, as you can see, even on the dining room table, there was a silver service with, for the vinegar and oil, that kind of thing. But I wasn't interested in crystal or china or books and bookcases. So I went to the next rooms, which were the parlors, both parlors. And in the center entrance, right near, it's hard to see because of the light, but right near the staircase was a, a long, thin, narrow piano forte. And it still played the keys plinked as I walked along, going to the parlors, the parlors were full of furniture. Uh, sofas, chairs, tables with lamps, paintings on the wall. Dusty and dirty, but everything was there. Well, again, nothing of interest to me, so I went upstairs. Now upstairs, the four bedrooms, three of them finished, one of them unfinished. And as I got to the top of the stairs, I went to the first bedroom on the left, the back one, and it had beds with bedding, dressers full of clothing, nightstands, oil lamps, paintings on the wall, and the furniture, the, all the dressers had clothing in them. It was amazing. And the one thing that um, surprised me, I guess, the, although the wallpaper was coming off, there was nothing destroyed. The, all the windows were intact, but the issue there was animals like mice had come in and just nibbled on the pillows where a person lays their head and they leave body oil. That was the only sign of damage in the whole house. Everything else had been preserved perfectly. So I checked all three bedrooms, not finding anything I wanted. And the last room was unfinished. It was a four bedroom house, but they didn't really need the fourth bedroom. And um, this house belonged to Cy Coffin's grandfather, Benjamin Coffin. And I didn't know that at the time, obviously, because I was just starting to explore the house. But Benjamin Coffin was a father of two children. He didn't need the house. He, the house was built by his father who had two children. They didn't need that extra room. So for the purposes up until I was in that house in the early 1960s, nobody ever used that room. And it didn't even have a floor. It just had the floor joists and the plaster and lath from the room from the kitchen down below. And as I was ready to leave, I looked over at the chimney. Now this representation here, that rectangular box-like thing, is the chimney that came from the first floor where the cook stove was hooked into it, right through the second floor, right up through the roof. And on the floor, next to the chimney, I could see some papers, newspapers and some envelopes. So I tiptoed gingerly across those joists to get to the attic, holding a flashlight, leaned down, and there were, among the papers, there were some envelopes with stamps from the 1860s, 1870s, 1880s. And I, thought I'd found treasure. So I was very excited. And as I'm pawing through this stuff, I lost my balance. So I kind of leaned against the chimney, but I didn't do it very well. And I hit the back wall, and I just kept right on going. And I'm thinking to myself, as a young man thinking, oh god, nobody's been in this house in a lot of years, and they'll never find my body. <laughs> <laughs> but I landed with a crash onto a wooden floor in an unfinished attic room that to me was a secret room because the only way I couldn't tell that there was a doorway and I had fallen through a doorway into this attic room. And amidst the cloud of smoke, the dust that blew around me, I could see a light behind me and there was an attic window 
in this, and it was the attic space above the um, summer kitchen down below. Well, you wouldn't tell that from the house because on the second floor there was no doors or anything. It was through this, uh, through this unfinished room. Now the story gets better. In this attic space were three large humpback trunks. And the first one on the left, I opened it up, and these three trunks were, had the metal rims, they were wood and metal, and when that lid shut, it was like airtight. So when I opened that trunk up, it was full of the family's finest clothing. Linen, silk, it was just amazing. Men's and women's clothing, very well preserved, put in this trunk and closed. The middle trunk I opened up and immediately I noticed a 13 star flag. And I picked it up and held it up and in the dim light I could see that it was, had some writing on it and it was about four by six and it was very beautifully preserved but I wasn't interested in the flag so I folded it up and underneath it were, the trunk was full of leather bound books. Now I told you I was, a, I'm a retired librarian. Can you imagine how I've kicked myself all these years because I put the flag back on the books, closed the trunk, and left them. The third trunk was the biggest trunk of all. Of course, that makes for a better story. But the third trunk was the biggest trunk, and when I opened it up, down in the bottom were three or four bundles of letters and envelopes tied up with string. So I had found, again, treasure, because as I untied those bundles, there were approximately 100 envelopes with stamps, and they were from the 1850s right up to the 1880s, 1890s. But because I told them I only wanted stamps, I took all the contents out of those envelopes and set them in a separate pile. How I regret that day. So I had found about 100 envelopes with stamps that I was collecting at the time. And I, there were a big pile, so I looked around and I went back out in the unfinished bedroom and I found a bushel basket and I kind of put those envelopes in the bushel basket and put the rest of the letters back in the trunk. And as I was closing the trunk lid, the top of the lid was very heavy. And I noticed that there were two brass eagles in the top and one was pushed to the side and I could see that there was a lid. So as I pushed the lid, the eagle to the right, the lid actually dropped and two bundles dropped into my lap, literally. They were sealed in rawhide leather tied with rawhide string. So what I had discovered there was the family's most precious, personal, valuable documents, including paperwork that everybody keeps, old checks, and this is the newest transportation at the time. But Genesee College, class of 1860, this American Express document is Wells Butterfield, Livingston Fargo, even before Wells Fargo. That's from 1859. Now notice the condition. They're like brand new. Everything in these trunks was sealed airtight. And then I began to find documents in those piles that dealt with the 27th Regiment and the 33rd Regiment and letters to the House of Representatives asking for pensions. This stamp, by the way, is from 1845. It's the third stamp the American government ever made. It is quite valuable. That's one I have kept. And all sorts of personal letters and documents. And then I started finding the family's land records and deeds and wills that had document stamps on them. Well, as a collector, an American document stamp, they were only used for 30 or 40 years. You had to pay for the privilege of having your document entered into the public record. So. I started finding these documents with $1, $5 stamps on them, and quite large. But also you can notice these documents say Benjamin Coffin, Kate Coffin, Justin Smith. Well, those names I didn't know yet, but they do have some significance with the rest of the story. So all of this stuff. And then on the pile of paper was this 1743 Virginia Land Company property map, and it's quite large. That's just one folio. It opens up to about three foot square, and it's all hand drawn on vellum. Beautifully done. Now, I'm not going to tell you about that at this point. I want somebody to ask me at the end of my presentation. If you don't, it's a, it's a teacher technique called anticipatory set. <laughs> if you don't ask, I won't tell you. And then 
pension records, and on and on, personnel correspondence, Civil War correspondence, then material that related to the Survivors Association of the 27th Regiment, 33rd Regiment, 1st Volunteer Regiment, pictures of a flag that was carried in the battle with all the battles, and then a document called or Personal Experience in Organizing Volunteer Soldiers in April 1861 and Participating with Them in the First Battle of Bull Run, signed by Hiram Seymour Hall. Well, I didn't know who he was, but it was his personal presentation paper with his notes. And my presentation is typed up just like this one. And obviously, Hiram Seymour Hall gave a presentation in 1892 somewhere. To, it said the Kansas, Kansas Commandery. Well, I didn't know what Kansas paperwork was doing in here or what was do, Civil War paperwork doing here. But it was all so uh, official looking. So as a young man, what do you do with all this stuff? I was 16 years old. I had no idea. I was a junior in high school, so we were dealing with the Civil War, so I thought that would be quite interesting to take a look at. So I put all the stuff that came out of the lid into the bushel basket, ran back to Cy Coffin's house, and said, Cy, look it, I found all this stuff in a trunk in a secret room, and it all pertains to your family. Wouldn't you like it? And he said, I don't want anything to do with it. Whatever you found is yours. I said, but there's a house full of furniture. And he said, I don't care. You can have whatever you want. And who am I to question somebody who's an adult and uh, didn't really have an answer for me? So I pondered that very much. But this was the impetus for me as a young man to learn about those stamps and then, as a result, learn about American history. And that's really where I, I got my love for American history and research because I took those stamps and started working with them and trying to find out what each of those time periods represented, including the Civil War. But life goes on. I mean, I was a high school kid. I ended up work, I ended working for Cy. I graduated high school and I started um, college at the University of Buffalo. And I just, all this paperwork, I just kind of stored in one of the trunks that my mother had and I went on with my life. Well, I, as I started college, a number of things happened. <laughs> the Vietnam War had gone on and uh, my father died and I would quit college for a semester to work so I could help my mother out a little bit. Well, guess what? I got drafted. So I was lucky enough and I did very well on testing so that I was uh, asked to go to officer candidate school and I did. I got my commission as a second lieutenant. And then after my three years of duty were up, I went to college and finished my bachelor's degree and then I got my master's degree in research and high school librarianship at Geneseo, a local college, and then I got married. I was, um, the life goes on, fate intervened. However, when my son put this together, I asked him, why are you including these particular pictures? I, and people are not going to care about your personal life. And he said, well, I want everybody to know that my dad was a veteran and did his job and that he was thin once. <laughs> this, I said, why did you include this picture? He said, well, I wanted them to show you that you were cool and you could grow hair. <laughs> and the third one he said, he said he included because he loves his mother and he was, wanted people to know how lucky I was to actually find somebody who would marry me. <laughs> so, um, we, as, as I worked at Fairport High School as a high school librarian, I was asked to work, asked to be a part of a program called Natural Helpers, where teachers and staff and students worked together to help kids in crisis. And we had a, um, a retreat down at Silver Lake. And one of the things that the organizer asked the teacher volunteers is, tell the students what your passion is, why you chose to be a librarian, why you wanted um, to do that for the rest of your life. And as I was pondering this question, my wife said, oh, just tell them about the old house and what it meant to you in terms of research and, and they'll understand the story. So I did and they really liked the story and they said to me, Mr. B, why don't you write a book? So that was the first germ that maybe the story was interesting enough to put together with a book. But I had no idea how to write a book or how to do serious research. I could research 
a magazine article and I taught my students at Fairport how to do that. So I said to Sherry, my wife, well, let's go look at the old house and, and be, go to see Cy Coffin and get some start on this. Well, Cy Coffin had died while I was in the military and getting my degrees and um, getting married and starting my career. And the farm had been sold off. As we drove down the road to where the old house was, the old house had crashed right in, right from the middle, right into the cellar. It was just broken in half, crashed. Looked through the windows, there was nothing left inside the house. So I said, oh, well, we don't have any leads here. Where are we going to go to start this research? So I said, well, this is a dead end. I'm not going to be able to continue. I'll wait, put it off. Well, everybody know where um, Eastview Mall is and the Valentown Museum across? OK, well, the Valentown Museum always has a, well, not always anymore, but had an antique show and sale every year on the grounds. And any time I go to an antique show or I, I go into an antique store, I always start looking at paperwork because obviously my find of paperwork was really, to me, monumental. And I'm always hoping to find something else. And I, now that I'm telling this story, I want you to know that I really believe in karma. Things happen for a reason. And as I went to the first table that had paperwork and maps, I looked down on the table and sitting in front of me, was the original 1863 muster out roll of Company G of the 27th Regiment. That doesn't mean anything until you start looking at it and the third, day, third name down was Hiram Seymour Hall. And then farther down in the privates is Benjamin S. Coffin. Well, this is the muster out roll of the 27th Regiment, Company G, that these two young men were a part of. And by this time, I at least knew that these names and that the fact that they were in the army because I'd read um, Hiram Hall's little pamphlet on organizing soldiers and taking them to the war. So this was really the impetus, the kick in the butt to get me going on some serious research. Now this is not a small document. It has eight pages on both sides. It opens up and it has a complete military record of every soldier in Company G of the 27th Regiment. When they were enlisted, how much pay they received, whether they were discharged on time, whether they were uh, deserters, whether they died in battle. So it has valuable research information that I'm glad to have. <clears throat> so I said, well, let's do a serious search. When you start to do research in genealogy, where do you start? <clears throat> well, you start at the very beginning. You go back to the area and you find the town historian and the local library and you start to work with that. And so I went back to the Nunday village of Nunday and I made an appointment to see the Nunday town historian who just happened to be Ruth Coffin Underhill. And she was a relative of Cy Coffin. She knew his son, one son that was still alive, who had liquidated the whole farm and property, and a cousin named Linda Coffin Common in Charleston, South Carolina. Well, by this time, after, this has been 25 years after I found all this stuff, I really didn't want to keep all the personal family information. The, the deeds and wills that have family names are valuable genealogy records for a family, not for a kid that found them in an attic and didn't know what to do with them. So when I contacted both um, Jim Coffin, the son, and Linda Coffin Common, I had a very interesting discourse with Jim Coffin, who, said, who on the phone and in letters told me that he didn't want anything. If his father didn't want it, he didn't want it. And I said, can you tell me why? the house was left that way. <clears throat> and he said, to make a long story short, <clears throat> Benjamin Coffin and his wife had two children. One of them was George Coffin, the father of Cy Coffin. George married, had two children, Cy being one of them, bought land from his father, was given land, and started farming, built a house, all the above. And at some point in time in his life, he decided he didn't want to be a farmer he didn't want to be husband. He didn't want to do anything. He abandoned the family and scooted. It took me 50 years to find him. He, was in, he left and went to California and changed his name. So he left a, ho a wife, a farm, a house, and two children destitute, basically, because they were farmers. So the wife apparently went to the elder coffins, Benjamin and Kate. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but that's who they went to. And they didn't offer any support or not enough support so that um, the wife was left feeling 
pretty bad about it because she had to raise children, run a farm, do all the things by herself. Well, it wasn't too long after that when she had asked for help that Benjamin Coffin died, and then the very next year, Kate Coffin died, and guess who inherited everything? The young mother with the two young children because she was the next and only relative. So she now had a thousand acres of land and dairy cattle and horses and a big prosperous farm and two houses. So because Kate <coughs> and Benjamin wouldn't help her, she had the house sealed in 1908. And I went into it in the early 60s, so it had been left for 54, 55 years without anybody going into it. So that's what I discovered when I went into the house. Well, in my correspondence <coughs> with Linda Coffin Common in South Carolina, she was a little leery about somebody just offering her family history papers without wanting something. So I convinced her that I, um, I was well-meaning, and she said, well, let me ask you one question. When you were in the house, what did the dining room table look like? And I said, well, it was about six feet long. It had a leaf in it. It's cherry. And on the table were dishes with about a foot in diameter with a gold leaf and green and red roses and crystal goblets. And she said, OK, I believe you, because that's in my dining room right now. So I said, well, tell me the rest of the story. So when Jim Coffin came to liquidate the farm, he called up his cousin, said, nobody in this side of the family wants anything in the ancestor's house. You can have it. You have to be up here in a week, one week. That's all you have. You can empty the house for all I care, or you can leave it because we're going to um, let it rot. We don't want anything from the house. So she came up with a U-Haul truck and took everything. And she has it now in Charleston, South Carolina. Well, she was a, a, a good opportunity for me to to get family photographs um, and more information on the family. And as it turned out, talk about karma, she was coming up to the Rochester area with her husband to visit her mother-in-law who was in the nursing home. So we met at the Rochester airport. That's when you could walk up to the airplanes and greet everybody. And <laughs> we went inside and sat at a table. And I gave her a whole packet of stuff with uh, the documents and the family signatures and all of that. And she gave me Benjamin Coffin's personal copy of the 27th Regimental History, which has been invaluable, and pictures. And we've had a wonderful um, conversation over the years about the family. And that was another impetus for me to write the book. So now I'm starting the quest to find out who these heroes, well, I call them heroes, who these guys were and what, they, what relevance they had. So with the history of the 27th Regiment, with Hiram Seymour Hall's pamphlet, first personal experience of organizing soldiers and taking them to first battle of Bull Run. And as a teacher, I have summers off. So I started doing research in the Rochester area. And we have a magnificent Rochester Historical Society. And they have magnificent Civil War materials. And across the hall on one of the tables, there's a bibliography that each of you should get if you're interested in finding a Civil War ancestor, because they will, they'll be very helpful. And they also have online databases like Ancestry.com. It's wonderful material. So if anybody asks me at the end, I'll be glad to show you where it is or help you with it. And Albany, New York has some stuff in the course of the historical collections of Livingston County. And then Carlisle Barracks in Carlisle, Pennsylvania is a US Army Military History Museum that has wonderful collections, of course, of the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and then all these battlefields. Well, my family got pretty tired of taking our summer vacations and going to <laughs> battlefields. My wife is a very patient woman. <clears throat> so what did I discover? Here's what I found. Hiram Seymour Hall <clears throat> and Benjamin Coffin were classmates at Genesee College in Lima, New York. When Abraham Lincoln put out the call for 75,000 soldiers. Hiram Seymour Hall thought that would be a great idea to quit school, enlist all his buddies from class, and go fight in a war. And this is the uh, college hall on the Lima campus. It's now Elam Bible Institute. But the buildings are still there, and they're in beautiful preservation. They've kept them, um, they've restored them. So I had the honor uh, last year to speak 
in this hall and the 150th anniversary um, telling this story to the Lima Historical Society and the Elam College students. And it was very emotional for me to be there. Well, anyhow, Hiram Seymour Hall and Benjamin Coffin recruited other students from their class. And <clears throat> the purpose of my book, <clears throat> not only to tell my little bit of my story, but to introduce them. And I wanted them to tell their own story. And each of them, I found as I did the research, were wonderful writers. Hall did more than just that one pamphlet that I found. He did four others, and three of them pertain to the history of Company G of the 27th Regiment throughout the first two years of the war, from 1861 to 1863. Coffin, on the other hand, was um, a correspondent to the Nunday News and the Mount Morris newspapers. And so there are articles that he wrote that give good background information and tell his story. So Hall and Coffin are telling their story. And in my research, I found two other soldiers who were writers. And one of them wrote for the Rochester Times. So I have articles. So what I wanted them to do was tell their own story. So this is Hall. And I won't go through the whole introduction because I don't want to uh, bore you with details. But Hall says, I would not, if I could, attempt to write a history of the period from April 15th to July 21st, but will simply give some account of incidents and events with my own knowledge. On Wednesday, April 17, 1861, after attendance at morning prayers in the chapel of Genesee College, Lima, New York, Benjamin Coffin and myself, student boys who expected to graduate at the June commencement, challenged each other to enlist as, as soldiers in a regiment which was forming nearby. We discontinued attendance of our recitations and imparted the project to our fellow students, a number of whom were eager to follow our example thus threatening to demoralize classes and considerably diminish the somewhat slender attendance at the college. Well, the president of the college didn't like that idea at all. He called a mass meeting of townspeople, students, trying to discourage these boys from quitting school to go to war. And so he made speeches. He had other faculty make speeches. And then when the students were asked to make speeches, they spoke to rousing applause, which embarrassed the school president. So he looked out over the audience to find somebody to support him. And he looked over and saw Mr. John Moser, who was the only banker in the village, hoping for support. So um, he asked Dr. Moser, Mr. Moser, to say something. And Mr. Moser rose deliberately so that everybody could see him and said, I have $100 to fit out a company for immediate service. <laughs> well, you can imagine what that did. Everybody just, it was a panic situation. The young men had won. They discontinued their attendance. And then Hiram Seymour Hall tells about what he had to do to organize a company and get ready to go to war. How do you enlist in the military as a college student? But he enlisted about 60 or 70 young men to go with him. Now, Benjamin Coffin had a little different take. Benjamin Coffin, um, and the, by the way, all the background pictures are pictures I've taken are from our historical photos from the Library of Congress collection, which you're free to use. All you have to do is give great bibliographic credit to it, which I've done in my book. So you learn these things as you go along doing research. The fall, the fall of Fort Sumter found me occupied with my books. It was my last term in college. I could study no more. And the Lima Company originated in my room, my name being the second on the enlistment roll. When we arrived in Elmira, and that's where the troops were massing to, to join up into different regiments, I was attacked with the measles. Now, in 1861, measles was a very deleterious ailment. So it was very life-threatening to him. So I was taken, having an aversion for the hospital, I was taken to a private house already crowded with the sick. One of my first experiences here was to lay all night with a corpse by my side without anybody to watch over me, and I was too sick to move. Imagine your first, as you're trying to enlist in the military, experiencing this. Coffin goes on to say what happened there, but he did not want to leave the, the service. He had just entered. He was ready to go. So here's what he did. Um, a leave of absence was given to me to return home until I was fit for service, and he never used it. This is the fervor. This is the, the drama of young men really wanting to fight to preserve the Union. I found a person who answered to my name, was inspected my, in my place, and took the oath of office for me. I returned to the house as I came, but was then a United States soldier for two years. So he went in no matter what. 
Well, because Hiram Seymour Hall pretty much organized that, they voted to uh, make him the executive officer in the, with the rank of second lieutenant, ensign or second lieutenant. Benjamin Coffin, Seymour Pierce, Walter Coffin enlisted as privates. So they went off to Elmira to join uh, Company G of the 27th Regiment. Now they were trying to organize a regiment with these disparate companies from different places in New York State. Company G was from Lima, Company H was from uh, Mount Morris, Company A was from Avon, one of the companies was from Long Island, New York. Anyhow, one of the things that Hall's responsibility was as an officer in this new unit was to find a commanding officer, a regimental commander. So he was lucky enough to find Henry Warner Slocum who moved up the ranks after Bull Run to be a major general, which is the highest rank, and Hiram Seymour Hall um, was a brilliant military leader, and he worked for every one of the major generals on the Union side, McClellan, Burnside, et cetera, et cetera. So he, Halleck, he did a lot of work for, to keep America, keep the Union preserved. Now, <clears throat> as I do research, I come across things. One of my favorite writers was a man named Sidney Harris, who wrote for the New York Times. And every Friday his column was things I learned en route to looking up other things. It was basically a trivia column. And I really enjoy trivia. So while I was doing research on uh, Benjamin Coffin, I came across this article, How and What They Feed the Volunteers. Well, they were in Elmira, 7,000 men. And this is the daily record of what they ate. The daily re supplies required very but little from the following. 550 loaves of bread, two pounds each, 800 quarts of milk when mush and milk is served, 200 dozen eggs, three to four to person. It requires seven bushels of potatoes to a meal, five bushels of beans, four barrels of soup, and 800 to 1,000 quarts of coffee, not counting the beef and pork butchered daily, just for 7,000 men. And every meal was coffee, bread, milk, potatoes, all cooked by steam. And in the history of the 27th Regiment, reading, they complained about how bad the beef was and how poor the food was. They didn't complain when they went to the field and all they got was hardtack. They couldn't complain about their training any more than that. Okay, so their training com com um, consisted of regimental drills, hand-to-hand -hand combat, marching, maneuvering, firing a rifle, and then um, both this 27th Regimental book and Hall talk about movements. Once they left Southport Barracks on the 15th of June, they moved towards Virginia and to where the Confederacy was amassing. But along the way, one of the trivia things they found is for their first 20 days of service, they were paid the total of $8.60. So 42 cents a day for their service. And Hall goes on to describe where they were stationed when they got to Washington. They were in Franklin Park, which is Kitty Corner across from where the White House is. Every piece of land that was a park in Washington, D.C. was soon taken over and barracks were built and became staging ground for the Union Army moving against the South. And so on and on, they talked about their training. I don't want to go into too many details. However, when they practiced with their rifles, this is what Coffin mentioned. The day was spent in target practice, each soldier firing 20 rounds. It is probable that none of the men had ever loaded a gun according to Army tactics, and the mistakes were many and ludicrous. In the language of one of the veterans of the regiment, they were given muskets. They weren't even given rifles yet. The old muskets kicked like a mule, and we returned to camp at night with lame shoulders. Well, that's not the worst of the story. So July 17th, they moved to Centerville. Saturday, July 20th, they were given three days rations with the order to cook them because they didn't know when they would get another meal. And on Sunday, Jan July 21st, um, they were woke, awakened at half past one in the morning, and many of them would never realize uh, their hopes and dreams of home and field because of the ensuing battle. So they were led into the first battle of Bull Run, and the 27th Regiment started in the north and came down. Now, when I wrote this book, like I said, I'm not a, a Civil War a historian, But one of the things that frustrates me as a researcher is when you get a Civil War book, it's a small book usually, 
black and white pages and all the pictures are in black and you can't see them. And then when they have talk about a battle like Gettysburg or First Bull Run or whatever, there's this army coming down with red arrows and this army coming down with blue arrows and all this mishmash. Well, I decided I wanted to know exactly where Company G was for those two years, every day for two years. So when I put the book together, my son and I did the book, it's self-published, he drew all the maps. I had him draw all the maps and I was responsible for knowing exactly where Company G was and the 27th Regiment. So all the maps for all the battles are accurate to what they described, all the sources that I could find. So I know exactly, and, and the readers of my book now know, where Company G fought. And every time I've gone to the battlefield, it's like deja vu. I've been there before because I've, this, I've lived their story for so many years. Anyhow, 27th Regiment was a flanking column, and the direction of our attack was uh, south, um, near the Warrington Turnpike and uh, Sudley Road. And the 27th Regiment was given the uh, initial order to charge first, and they rushed down the hill, driving the Confederate infantry and artillery away from <clears throat> the Stone House and the Henry House Hill. And the college boys in 27th Regiment took the hill. And the battle went on and on. And pretty soon they realized that the Confederate Army, even though there were far fewer soldiers, were very much better trained. And Hall goes on to mention <clears throat> that um, as they were advancing past the Stone House, by the way, this is my daughter on the steps of this house. It's still there. Uh, she's now a, a mother of two beautiful young women. Um, so you can see where our summer vacations were. Um, he talks about, Hall and Coffin talk about uh, their battle. And pretty soon, Hall says, soon without any apparent cause, the troops on our extreme right and left began to pass to the rear. Well, nobody had called a retreat, but pretty soon the Union realized, the Union soldiers realized that the Confederates were kicking their butt, so they started to retreat. Well, Hall tried to keep as many of his company, as many of his men together as he could, so he was able to keep 20 together. He urged them to stay together. And as they went back to Bull Run, the same way they came, trying, now there's this massive army, soldiers, horses, artillery, fleeing the Confederates. The one bridge across Bull Run, the Confederates lobbed around on it, destroyed the bridge, and, everything, and it was mass panic. And one of the funny things about it, not funny, is that our Congress, which is just 20 miles away, they, many of the people in the Congress, congressmen with their wives, came on their horses and buggies to see the battle, thinking that would be it. One day, and we'll whip the Confederates, and the war will be over. Well, the Confederates captured about 20 congressmen, and horses, and wives, and put the Union Army in retreat. It was a horrible day for the first battle for the Union. And Hall goes on to say, the loss of our regiment at the Battle of Bull Run in killed, wounded, and missing was 130. Now, regiment consisted of 10 companies of about 100 to 120 people. So you have a maximum of 1,200 men in a regiment. When you lose one-tenth of the regiment in the first battle, and it, it can't be that, I, I don't want to uh, misinform you, when he said missing, the, the loss, well, that was also missing and uh, wounded. So. It wasn't that many, but a number of Company G, 25 men from Company G, were unaccounted for. So what happened to Company G and our two soldiers after that? Now one of the funny things, again I say funny things, one of the unique things was Hall was a good writer. And Hall wrote in these pamphlets about the battles. And of course the 27th Regimental History had information about the battles. But Hall never mentioned Coffin his cousin, his classmate, his roommate. <clears throat> and what I discovered is that immediately after Coffin um, recovered from the measles, they were well aware of his organizational skills. So he was promoted to quartermaster sergeant and placed at the regimental headquarters to take care of all the paperwork, filing letters, dealing with promotions, troop movements, he stayed a part of Company G, but he never fought in the battles. And I call him a hero because who better to keep track of all this stuff that I found in the trunk than a quartermaster sergeant who has all these records at his disposal. And Hall I consider a hero because he led Company G into 25 
battles in two years. And he was wounded several times, but he led that company and very heroically, he was promoted to captain, commander of the company. So Hall was a commander, Coffin was a quartermaster sergeant. And um, so that's some of the paperwork I found in the trunk. So they fought in these 27 battles. After the war, Company G, two-year term of service ended May 31st, 1863. They were, at, at, they were at Chancellorsville. They were on the battlefield. When the clock struck May 31st, a writer came up and said, your unit is dismissed. Leave, board the train to go home. And that's exactly what they did. They marched off the battlefield, got on the trains and came home. Well, Hall didn't. But before I tell you that, what's on the screen? A picture of what? An American flag. How many stars on it? 13 stars. It says, 27th Regiment, New York Volunteers, Company A. It's four by six. It's the flag I found in the trunk. And it took me 50 years to track it down. It lives in Denver, Colorado with one of the descendants of the Coffin family. And part of the problem I had with the Coffin family, not that it was a problem, is that Jim Coffin, the son of Cy, when he dispersed everything, apparently he went into the house and got a flag and a bunch of swords and a couple things that belonged to Benjamin Coffin from the Civil War, although he never told me that. But I knew his children and I corresponded with them. And Jim Coffin was a military man who lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Seven children raised in the South. Those seven children did not want to admit that they had a Union hero in their family. So it was like pulling teeth to get information from them and get records. But anyhow, so I contacted one of the sons and he made a photo essay for me of this and I was able to use the flag. And when I was in uh, Saratoga Springs at the New York State Military History Museum, I showed them this picture and they, the New York State Military History Museum is where all the battle flags for all uh, New York State are housed and preserved and they don't know anything about this flag. They were delighted to know about a new flag that they didn't know about and they wanted me to get it back to New York State. The flag is worth about $10,000. I don't know how well I'll do with that. So, Benjamin Coffin returned home after the war, uh, had a daughter, Belle, and a son, George, and you know the rest of that story. Uh, he had considerable acreage. He, he was married to Catherine Smith in December 1863. He was a justice of the peace in Mount Morris. He held various posts. Uh, I have here American Legion, but he was in the Grand Army of the Republic, which is a forerunner of the American Legion where servicemen get together to tell their story. He also organized the Survivors Association of the 27th and 33rd Regiment, and they met every two years, and they kept a printed record of all the speeches, which is wonderful for the anecdotal record. However, I had to track them down someplace. Some are in San Marino, California. Some are in Virginia. Some are at the New York State Library in Albany. But I found as many as I could to put together in, in my book. And he had a, uh, a remarkable life afterwards. Hall, on the other hand, didn't leave the military, stayed on, and he wanted to stay and help fight for the Union. So when Company G came home to Lima, he re-enlisted and wanted, uh, became the commander, company commander of Company K of the 121st Regiment. Well, he was immediately sent to Gettysburg. And his company was put on Little Round Top, right next to Joshua Chamberlain of the 54th Maine. Now, if you've seen the movie Gettysburg, it's all about Joshua Chamberlain and the 54th Maine. Well, Hall, um, Hall and Chamberlain were good friends, fought the same battles. That's the same story. He wasn't satisfied just being a company commander, so he personally petitioned Abraham Lincoln to appoint him to a regimental command of a colored troop, which was in its infancy. So. Lincoln signed a paper making him a colonel and authorized him to organize a regiment. And he trained them so well that they were usually the first unit into battle in any of the ensuing battles from 1863 to the end of the Civil War. At the mine before Petersburg, just before they were entering into Richmond, uh, Hall led his colored troop into battle, into the crater, and he got his right arm blown off. 
So instead of quitting the service, he went home to recover. And six weeks later, he was back leading the regiment in all these battles as a one-armed colonel. And when the war ended with General Sheridan, he took those black soldiers to the frontier, and they were the forerunners of the Buffalo soldiers. So he is a very interesting figure. And by the way, the rest of that story is going to be book two, just so you're interested. So he waited to 1866 to be discharged. So he was in for a full five years. And then he wandered as he left the military. I think he, because of my ensuing research, I had to track him down to the frontier. And he went out to Idaho and Montana and went all over the, the prairie and the uh, frontier, basically. I think he had post-traumatic stress syndrome. But after a full year, he got himself together, went back, married his girlfriend, homesteaded in Missouri, had a farm in Missouri, raised a family, four children, and he was an upstanding citizen, chairman of the Republican Party and a public school superintendent, etc. And in 1888, he moved to uh, Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, he, again, was in Grand Army of the Republic. He was a member of the Masons. Both soldiers were Masons, and there's an interesting side story to that. And in 1892, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor for merit, for meritorious service. And he was for the two injuries he'd received at Gaines Mills and Rappahannock Station. So he really was a brilliant military leader. And he was, in my estimation, a wonderful hero. So that's my story. And that's what this book is all about. I got them to tell their own story. Um, I traveled all over the country to find this information. There's a lot of things in the book that is um, personal, private documents that have never been published. The family has been giving me stuff over the years. And by the way, the pictures of the rooms, the furniture in the rooms, after the book was published, Linda Coffin Common, I asked her, I called her up and I said, by the way, I, you mentioned you had the furniture. Do you, can you send me some pictures? Well, she sent me about 40 pictures. And so I used them in the slide presentation. So those pictures of the furniture is the actual furniture out of the house. So. Now, another interesting sidelight. Um, in because my book is independently published, self-published, there's an independent publishers association that tries to get new material out to the public. And in 2012, I uh, submitted my book, and it won the silver medal for the best regional nonfiction book in the country. So I'm very, very proud of that. My son and I, thank you. My son and I went to New York City to, to receive the award, and it was really a heady experience for the first time for an author to, to win a national award. Now, Benjamin Coffin died in 1906. Kate Coffin died in 1908. That's when the house was sealed. I traveled all the way to Oak Hill Cemetery in Lawrence, Kansas, to find Hiram Seymour Hall's grave. So, that's my story. Questions? The Virginia land map. Thank you very much. <laughs> By the time that the 27th Regiment and Company G had, by the time they had gone to fight at um, Fredericksburg in Virginia, they were across the Rappahannock River from the village of Fredericksburg, and the Confederates were on the hill. And the Confederates were doing a very good job of blowing any kind of excursion. They blew up the bridges, so the Union had to make pontoon bridges. This is all related to your question. They had to make pontoon bridges to bring the Union Army across the river. And once they got enough, including the 27th Regiment, that was one of the first units across the river, once they got enough Union, they went towards Fredericksburg. While the Confederates who owned the city moved out of it, including all the people, abandoning the village. So Benjamin Coffin writes an interesting story called The Tale of an Unfortunate Man. And he talks about having access to a city full of things and that he was so unfortunate. And this is the rest of the story. He went to a, a china shop and he had this big overcoat on with lots of pockets. And he filled his pockets with china, thinking it would be nice to be at regimental headquarters with beautiful china. Well, then he went to the tobacco shop. A tobacco warehouse, and he got rid of most of his china and stuffed his pockets with tobacco because everybody smoked. 
So he filled up. And then somebody said, the bookstore, the bookstore. So he ran to the bookstore and he started taking out tobacco and uh, stuff and putting uh, books in there. And one of the ironies was his father was a Methodist minister and Hall stole the book from the bookstore, the um, Methodist denominations in the United States. And I have a picture of that in my book. So he stole that for his father. So these were war times. And they weren't particularly good times because now it's a kind of search and destroy. When the Union Army or the Confederate Army came into an area after two years of really hard battle, they took whatever they wanted and they destroyed whatever they couldn't carry. Well, one of the last things somebody yelled out was the bank. And so he was one of the first there. He jumped over the counter and there's Confederate and Union script that was negotiable. So he filled his pockets later. And he went into the vault underneath and went into the storage boxes. And apparently that's, I don't know this for sure, but apparently that's where he found the map. It's a hand-drawn Virginia Land Company map of the area where the Battle of Bull Run was fought. But he had the original land grant for where Bull Run was. So he took that as a war souvenir and kept it with him. Well, the unfortunate, he tells the unfortunate thing is, after all of that, when he got back to um, the base, he started emptying his pockets where he realized that the overcoat that he left with his horse while he was racing around the bank, somebody had ripped up everything, ripped off everything. So basically he says, I had the whole city at my disposal and all I came back with was the book of religious denominations and this map. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you very much. You've been a great audience.